chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had preformed out of the ground all wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them in, them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock and birds in in the sky and all wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Deep, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and sa femme étaient tous les deux nus, et ils n'ont ressenti aucune honte. You may be seated. You know, do I finally look like I fit the part of being from Idaho? Do I look like I'm a coach? I'm a coach to kids, absolutely. For six long, wonderful weeks this past summer, I had the joy, the torture, of spending these weeks with these kids. During our third week, we had examined the life of King David, and we talked about bullying, kindness, faithfulness, Worship and family, five pillars, five important things to kids. And some of their favorite devotions came out of this one week. And so this morning I will be sharing what it takes to build a godly family, starting with Psalm 127, verse 1. Israel's greatest king... King David wrote this psalm about his son, Solomon. Solomon, like his father, was also a great king who built the temple. This is one of the greatest feats that was done during this time period. He not only, stood, only understood building, he was directly involved in the building process. If anyone, if anyone understood what building was and is, that it's hard work, and it takes long hours, and requires extensive training, and demands financial sacrifice, it was Solomon. The same is true of building godly marriage and family. That is why David started out with, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. A nation is only as strong as the families that make up that nation. The same is true of the church. Strong churches do not make strong families. Strong families make strong churches. And as we grow in the, in the amount of our strength, our families will grow deeper and spread their, their reach wider. Solomon understood the importance of having a good general contractor. To build the temple. Anybody here a builder? Steve? Yeah? A few of you. Anybody here ever build anything? Bob? I don't build anything. I look at the blueprint, okay, the, the pamphlet. Hey, Stephen, what does this say? Dad, it's upside down. 
Stephen built for me a happy birthday, Stephen. I know you said you'd be watching. Uh, he had built this, this end table for me, and he forgot like eight processes. And so when I went to go open the drawer, it just comes off. Not only that, there's nothing there for me to finish. I don't know what's missing. Solomon understood the blueprint. He understood the importance. And the same principle goes towards the family. You cannot build a godly family unless the Lord Jesus Christ is the general contractor. Look again at this verse. It says, unless the Lord builds the house. You see, Jesus was a carpenter while he was on this earth. And today he is involved in three very important projects. He is building a home for our future, a place called heaven. In John 14, 1 through 3, Jesus says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. He says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it, this were not true, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, if I go and prepare, I will come back and take you to be with me. That where I am, there you will be also. He is building a place for our faith. The church. Unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers, the builders labor in vain. He says he's building a place, the church. And lastly, he is desiring to build a home for your family. I'm not talking about the physical walls. I'm not talking about, about what you would hang the nail in or, or anything like that. I'm talking about the foundation for your family. This takes hard work. <laughs> A good general contractor and a good foundation, something Solomon knew very well. With this in mind, I invite you to open your Bibles if you have them to Genesis chapter 2. And I thank our kids and my Letitia for reading this passage for us. Uh, they practiced it. They did a really good job. So I'm going to start in, there in the beginning. The Lord God said, it is not good for a man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Every family is built upon a source of authority. <laughs> Some turn to the culture around them, and if they had a Christian family, they come from Christian parents, Christian biblical foundation, who loved the Lord, who believed in the word of God, who taught biblical morality, and as April and Shamus reminded us, they drink of the living water that refreshes their soul and makes them thirst no more, then that person has a good foundation to build upon, to build their family, to build their marriage, to build their life. Sadly, many people reject godly values, choosing instead to build their foundation upon materialism or alcoholism or drug addiction. As a result, their children will grow up in an atmosphere of turmoil and conflict. I myself am a product of this kind of family. In many families, there's nothing but arguing and fighting in the home, and whoever is loudest or most violent often will win that battle, that fight. And they'll get their way. And the child sees this. And they will most likely repeat this pattern as they grow up. Others find their source of authority in their culture around them. They will follow the media and whatever the media says. We all know that media is all slanted except for a few outlets, they will follow whatever is said, or maybe the celebrities, whatever the celebrities say, we're going to do, we're going to follow their fashion, we're going to follow their attitudes, we're going to follow them, or maybe even the politicians. 
and they allow these people to serve as the basis of their standard. What they say, what they believe, what they want. This culture is destroying and undermining the biblical authority and biblical foundation for family. Look again at this verse. The Lord God said, this is God talking, the one who established the institution of marriage and family. He said, I will make. Marriage and family are divine institutions. They're God's idea. The first family was formed by God. It was established by his power and it was sanctioned by his authority. Sure, there are some great books, some dynamic marriage counselors, some wonderful seminars and tremendous research out there that can be helpful. But the ultimate authority of what marriage and family is supposed to be like is what the God of all scripture says. And verse 18 tells us, it tells us to put God first, to put him first in everything, put him first. He is the one who created the first family. And it says in this verse that he is the authority. Remember right there uh, in, in, in Joshua's Bible, uh, Joshua had it underlined, it is not good for man to live alone. I will make a helper suitable. God gave Eve to Adam, and they were brought together as husband and wife. Look at verse 24. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. The goal is oneness. The goal is togetherness, and the goal is unity. The Lord is saying that there are temporary relationships in the family. And there are permanent relationships in the family life. The word leave, I'm going to go uh, back to this verse. The word leave here reveals an important principle. When we are married, we are to leave our previous family behind. Now, this doesn't mean that you simply leave your, love, your previous loved ones and you say goodbye and you leave them forever. We should never do that. That is not as what is being said. Unless there's toxic reasons involved. We shouldn't leave them like that. But when you get married and have a family, you are putting together something new, something that never existed before. It's your family. It's your marriage. It's you. My mom wanted April to be exactly like her. Yeah. Hallelujah, April is stubborn. <laughs> Sorry. Did I say that out loud, Mom? I did? Okay. <laughs> she wanted April to do everything that she did. And April, April understood, this is my marriage. That's my husband. I'm his wife. April understood that. And here we have the second word, united to his wife. Instead of united, some, word, some translations use the word cleave, which refers to compatibility. If you are going to build a godly marriage, there must be compatibility in the family. So Jesus quotes this verse in Matthew 19, verse 5, and he explains it. In verse 6, so they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. These two words, united and joined, creates a bond that is so strong that it cannot be broken without serious damage to both pieces. Like Pastor Ed, I like to get into the Hebrew, get to the understanding of what is being said, and give you a good picture I couldn't find exactly what I wanted, but picture plywood that is molded together through high pressure. And we're talking thousands of pounds of foot pressure per little inch. You cannot simply separate one layer without serious damage to the rest. 
This is true in the family. You can't just separate one layer. Well, I'm just not going to gonna be your parent anymore. We have many of our kids in single parent housing situations. Let's be real. Many of our, of our day camp kids, they don't see their dad or their mom's not in the picture. I would often be called mommy or daddy or Pastor Brian. People don't realize you just simply don't leave and remove that layer. There is great damage to the rest of it, to both pieces. The number one requirement for building a godly family is commitment. Are you committed to your faith? It starts there. Commitment to your faith. Then when you marry, you are committed to each other. When the children come along, you are committed to them. And you are committed for the long haul. Terrible twos are nothing. Terrible 18s coming back from a foreign country. Now that might be something. Right? Right? Uh, let's be honest, right? She was difficult coming back from America. She, she no longer watching racing, only watching football. We got her trained. But right, sometimes it's hard, this chapter of your life story, and we want to walk away. Where is the commitment? The commitment for the long haul. Every part of that family needs to be glued together like that plywood. If the marriage and the family are to be firm, strong, and lasting, it must start with God and it must have uni unity, working towards oneness. But it also must be a family of grace. Thank you, Letitia, for reading this. I could not have one of our kids read this. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Wouldn't it be great if there was a verse 26 that said, happily ever after, the end, no more. But we know after chapter 2 comes chapter 3. And chapter 3 is the sad account of the first family and how sin entered into the life and into the human race. Adam and Eve went from being unashamed in chapter 2 to Adam saying in chapter 3, verse 10, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Such a hard thing to read. One of the things you have to understand to build a godly family is that we are all sinners. You married a sinner. <laughs> Your sinner married a sinner. Same is true in Christian families. You may be saved. Mom and dad may be saved. We may be all saved. But we are all sinners. Every one of us. Christian dads battle temptation. Christian moms make mistakes. Some of them won't admit it, but they do. Christian boys and girls struggle and blow it. We are all sinners. Every one of us. When the Lord confronted Adam about his sin, Adam blamed Eve. It's her. It's her fault. It's all her. <laughs> In uh, verse 12, then Adam blamed God. It's the woman that you gave me. It's all your fault. Notice what happened in verse 21. In verse 21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. You want to know where grace entered into Scripture? It happened right here. This was a picture of salvation. It's a picture of grace. God covered their nakedness. Grace covered their sin. Not only are we all sinners and selfish, but we are also damaged goods. When I went to Taiwan, Stephen and I, back in 2011, I, I found this shirt in this, this uh, clearanced out Christian bookstore in Iowa. And it says, God buys ugly lives. 
And I had no clue how big this shirt was going to be when I wore it in Taiwan. And I had a couple ladies wanting it from me. We are damaged goods. Sometimes we go into the clearance section of a store, and we find clothing of the finest quality. And we look at it. It's incredibly marked down. That's the aisle that April likes a lot. Most of this outfit was from the clearance section, except for my shoes. And we think to ourselves, such quality, such beauty of design, such workmanship, and so cheap. But then we notice the little sign that says, slightly spoiled, greatly reduced in price. Right? Similarly, in the market of life, we find ourselves marked down. We are gifted, cultured, and of high potential, but slightly spoiled in speech, in character, in reputation, and drastically reduced in worth. Yet, we are all salvageable by God's grace. God can change you. God can do a work of grace in your life. You can be everything God intends you to be by his grace. Let me say that again. We are salvageable. It doesn't matter, matter what kind of sin and gunk we have hidden in our closet or our garage or that special room that we have locked that we don't let people go to. We can be saved by God's grace. A family where grace is understood makes all the difference in the world, right? I married into a family that my father-in-law understood grace with me. He understood that I was rough around the edges. He understood that. Some of you have people of grace in your life. The greatest example of a family of grace embodied in Scripture is the story of the prodigal child, no, not, not Letitia, the prodigal boy found in Luke. And he said, Father, give me my share of the inheritance. And his father gave to him. And that boy took all that he had and he proved that he was a sinner and that he was selfish. And he left for the far off country. With the broken heart, the father let his son go. And he took off. Do you know what happened in that far off country? He joined himself. He glued himself to it. And to the sins of it. And to the darkness that was there. Some of you are glued to the standards and morals of this ungodly world. And what happened to you just like it did to this poor boy. It took him all the way down to the pig pen. Where he had said to himself... I don't deserve to be a son anymore. But I would rather be a servant of my daddy than live like this. Anybody here, here ever work in a pig pen? No? I worked for two weeks cleaning pig pens to earn an engagement ring for April. It is disgusting. It is filthy. It is everything vile that you can think of and more. And one's wrong slip It didn't matter how nice the shirt you wore. I have experience. But in, so as he's cleaning, as he's shoveling, they didn't have high-pressured hoses like we had. <laughs> he had to shovel, and he had to keep moving and keep scooting to get it out. That boy came up and out of that pig pen and headed home. The Bible says that the father saw his son from afar off. The father didn't say, you sorry piece of plunder. You embarrassed me before the whole family. You embarrassed me at church. Don't show your face around here anymore. Go back to where you came. No, the father didn't say any of that. The boy came back. The only thing that he deserved was judgment, not grace. Grace is unmerited favor, something that we deserve. You don't deserve it. 
No sooner did the boy start his apology, his dad wrapped his arms around him, around that stench, most likely, around the muck and mire that was on his body. And he put a robe on him and a ring on his finger, and he said, come on home, son. Welcome back. There are times when transgressions are so great that forgiveness is very difficult. Amen? But it's hard. But where there is genuine repentance and remorse over sin, there should be room for genuine forgiveness and restoration. What are you building your life and your family upon? You know, I, I, I look over here to Pastor Ed, and he's been married. I don't want to say the number because I'll be off, and I might say a too high number, and he might shake his head, and I might say too low, then Mr. Roma might say, no, it's more. They're established. They have built their life upon the rock. Some of us have been married for a long time, and just coming to that rock, that foundation of faith, coming to Jesus, some of us are doing that. Some of us, we are uncertain. So I ask you, what are you building your life, your family upon? Is it the rock of Christ Jesus? You know, the wise man built his house upon the rock and it stood firm, but the foolish man built it on sand and it came tumbling down. If your life is built on the rock of Christ Jesus, or is it built on a foundation you managed to lay? What's going on in your family today? Right now, what's going on there? Are there any needs that should be addressed today? Is there forgiveness that needs to be extended today? Are there confessions that need to be made today? Do you need to come and pray for your family? Many of us have our family listed on the, on the cross. We have our burden. We've taken it to the cross. Let me ask you, did you leave those burdens at the cross last week or have you, or did you take them back with you and you're still carrying them? Do you need to come to Jesus Christ, the living water for salvation, today? Are you a wayward, a prodigal, and you need to come home? The next two verses was uh, some that some of our kids really liked, two of them actually. Psalm 24, verse 3 asked us two questions. It says, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? That's a question for us. We're sinners, every one of us. Who may ascend? And then the psalmist gives the answer in first part of verse 4. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Do you want to ascend the mountain of the Lord and stand in his holy place? It starts by putting the Lord first in all that you do. Schoolwork, homework, work work, family life, sports teams, extracurricular activities. Put him first in all you do. Seeing that we are sinners and selfish. Like the prodigal son putting the Lord first, we begin with confessing of sin and the forgiveness of others. Keep your word to God in your family. Keep it. Even if it's hard to keep. Even if they put you and back you up into a corner and you don't want to fulfill your promise, keep it. Because that's the first thing that we talked about you needed, a commitment. Obey your parents. <laughs> I'm looking at the pink warriors back here. Obey your parents. Especially you. 
Obey your parents. I acknowledge that sometimes our parents are not walking in the Lord and the direction that they want us to go is, will be damaging to us or contrary to our faith. For the most part, we can obey them. Obey them. And drink daily from the living water found in Jesus. So I've asked many questions this morning already. I've asked many questions. Which category are you? Do you need to address that? Do you need to seek forgiveness, grant forgiveness? In a few moments, we're going to close in prayer. See, the earlier slide had a picture of a family, and there was a picture of a church. We are a church family. And if you're visiting us, welcome. we welcome you wholeheartedly. See, that's what the body of Christ should be. A church should be welcoming. And we are glad you traveled from Montana, from Belgium, and 82 other U.S. states you made your trip through. Uh, we're one family. Part of our family is getting ready to embark on a new trip. Right? This is going to be a good trip. This trip is to Kentucky. Part of our family, there's a whole list of them on the yellow slip of paper. And they are going to, I believe it's the poorest county in the United States of America. Picture how poor you think it is and divide that by, by, by four. And that's your number. It is so barrenly poor. And our team, our family members, 18 of you, uh, I'm going to invite you to come as I say your name. Uh, Annie, Sarah, Pastor Ed, Steve, Jan, Joan, Brenda, Dave, Isabel, Gail, Wayne, April, John, Diana, Joy, Lori, Ken, and Liz. What a great message to send you guys out on this work and witness trip. Some of you will be building, some of you will be painting, some of you will be plucking up, some of you will be investing, and that's what it's about, investing in the hearts and lives of the people of, of Kentucky. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, that's the one who can ascend the mountain of the Lord. We want to pray over you. And we would invite those of you who would like to come forward and, and pray. Maybe you want to pray over your own hurt, your own pain, your own burden. Maybe you want to come and, and pray over this one of these 18 members. But we would invite you to do so, do so now. Let's pray. Father, as we come forward to this altar, we're laying these 18 lives down upon you. Upon your altar. And we thank you for them, Lord. Father, they have a huge mountain to go to, a mountain of, of filth, a mountain of, of poverty. Father, they are going to be your hands and feet. Father, in many ways, they are the prodigal son's dad and mom. Lord, we pray a hedge protection around them as they even travel from here down to Lewiston. That you would, Lord, give the pilots a great night's sleep so that they are not distracted in their in their duty. Lord, that you would protect them as, as they weave through Louisville and Cincinnati and, and into Kentucky. Father, that you would bless them with not only your presence and power, but, Father, with rest and assurance. Lord, may they go with a clean heart and clean hands as they minister and Lord, for those children and those 
single moms and those single dads who are coming to them with drug addiction, with abuse. Father, we pray that that this team, our team, our family, Lord, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit and minister right there. Lord, that they would take the hands and knees gospel right to the people. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we as a church, Lord, as as a family, as a body of Christ, are blessed to send. We pray, Lord, that you too would bless us through their returning and their sharing the stories of these little boys and little girls and older boys and older girls, their heart story. And Father, for those who have come forward because they are burdened with sin or they're a prodigal returning or they are working towards forgiveness of the hurt of family members, we pray that your peace would flood over their souls, penetrate into the deepest part of their hearts. And we thank you. Father, as we dismiss, may we go in your presence. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.